Tonight, the one and the many. Of all the subjects that I explore, always go back to one and many. Therefore, I'd like to bring together a lot of reflections on this most interesting subject. First, theologically, first level. Terminology, God, the one, and the good. Is there some way in which we can say, without some philosophical blasphemy, mixing of terms, to say that the idea of the God, the idea of God needs to be understood as the one or it is diminished in its capacity in some way. Let's try it. If we talk about the one as a primary idea, then it's quite simple to reason and say, well, if one is your primary term, then why did the one become or cause a many? They fit together, one and many. So if you start out with the highest term being the one, then you have to account for a multiplicity. You have to account for a process. You have to account for some way in which this can do that. You then must search for ideas to try to understand that. But when you have the idea of God, then, to talk about a manyness, it doesn't follow that if there is a God, you necessarily have a problem of manyness, as you have with one and many. Indeed, with the problem of God and manyness, you need the idea of creation. When you have the idea of creation, then you have the idea of manyness, because creation is a multiplicity of forms. But there are many views of God that don't entail God being the one. The image of God as being a source of good gives us the problem of good and evil. You don't have the problem of good and evil as a primary set of ideas with the one and the many. You have the problem of good and bad. When you have the idea of good and evil, in any religion, then you're posing a counterforce, a demonic force that's opposing the good. And therefore, you invariably have and must have a clash, a war, a conflict. But good and bad doesn't entail a clash. Now, nearly all religions say that God is one. But when they say that God is one, that's not the same thing as to say that God is the one. Because God is one doesn't preclude the fact that there can be other ideas of God as one or other things being ones. But when we say God is the one, then we mean that God is the one and that precludes any other oneness. The one. Because as you move from a one and put in the word the, you move from a particular a one what. You move from a adjective, a one something, to a substantive, the one. That makes it a substantive, 
and it is the one, only one, the one. Now, in the kinds of reflection that we're going to engage in then, we want to know whether or not we can talk about why it is that the idea of the good is linked with the one. If you have an idea of the one, does it entail the good necessarily? How do we reason about this? Could it be that one of these, either one, is higher than the other? Well, let's assume that's the case and see what would follow. If, therefore, the ultimate term is the one, and the second term derived from it, the good, and then other terms following as a metaphysical creation, as it were, a process or unfolding, then we need to use just one idea. Whatever we want to be the highest term, we want it to be the most ideal term. That is to say, a term for which no other term can be chosen better than it. Therefore, the ideal term for the final, ultimate term must also not only be better, but the best. So then, if we put the one first and say necessarily it follows from this unfoldment, the good then follows it, so that this is the ultimate and this is derived, then we can say, well, how can the ultimate term, the one, not be good? not be good if it is the best. Because the best means the highest good. So that won't work. Well, let's turn it around and say, suppose we put the good and the one derived secondary. Well, if the good is the ultimate term and the next term derived from it is the one, then the good would not be one, but would be both, if it's not one, if it is not one, it would both be good and not good. And that's absurd for us because we want the highest term, the most ideal term, to be the best and the highest expression. Therefore, from this consideration, we're going to say that we can express the highest term as a hyphenated combination of these two terms. Now, in order to play with this, I think it's necessary to take a look at this idea of one, the one. First, we're going to take it in terms of anything we look at. When you look at anything, me, here I am, right? right? Certainly, I am one man. But with anything that you see, including this marker I have here, right? Now, most strictly, we want to reason as strictly as we can. Right? We want to know whether what would describe most accurately your perception of this? Do you see the whole of it? Because when you see it, would you not agree there are parts of it that you don't see? Therefore, you don't see the whole of anything that's three-dimensional. Because there's always a part you don't see. So therefore, in perception, all you see is parts. Would you agree you don't see all of the parts in a unity? You assume all the parts are in a unity, and you hope, seriously enough, that they will remain together. 
but you don't see that, you infer it. You make a judgment. You make a judgment that when I turn this around, its parts that were not visible to you now will become visible. So you infer a whole. When we call it one marker, we mean something curious because if there's a difference between a one and a unity and a parts and a whole, in what way can we say one sees a one? For from our reasoning, what you really see are parts. You infer it has a wholeness to it. You infer the parts coming together as a whole has a unity and that the unity implies again a one. Now, furthermore, we do not agree anything that we're talking about is subject to change. And if we wait long enough, whatever we're talking about will fall apart and become parts of something else. So therefore, it looks like we can say that everywhere we do this curious thing calling things one, it's not in the perceptual realm that we see the one. Now, somehow we grasp it as one. Look here. We grasp it as one. Would you not agree that all of the arts of camouflage is to take something and blur the boundaries in such a way that it seems to to flow into the surrounding, merge with the surrounding. Therefore, you don't see it, you don't grasp it as one. Even though it's visible, having all parts and a whole and a unity. So therefore, you need a boundary. You need a boundary. You need some kind of boundary. And you want to say something about the boundary that it's not itself a part. It's not just a unity but it has a continuation. Something happens to it with the unity. Now maybe we can take this idea of one and apply it for a few moments to the idea of its symbolic representation. That's what we're going to do next. Look here. I have a name that I'm talking about, I'm talking about one. I have a symbol, Arabic. I could also use Roman and other ways of symbolizing one. Right. Now, let us now apply this idea for a moment to take another number, two. It has a symbol, and would you agree it has parts? Right. And it has a unity. So the parts itself each must be a one. Each must be a one. And they must come together and then in that unity we call them two. Because would you agree if I put one over here and one over here, if I mean to consider that together, I have to in some way embrace them together to call it a two. So for each number, regardless of what number we're talking about, all it is are many ones. That's all they are. The whole arithmetic is nothing other than many ones. Now, the many ones, wherever we stop counting as it were, then we just have this, don't we? An unending number of ones. And if I say three, I mean this collection. If I mean four, I take that collection, and so on. So therefore, numbers are nothing other than a collection of ones brought together into a unity. But this isn't enough. 
there's an assumption we're making about representing this idea of one symbolically, and I'd like to take a minute out to propose something, and that will be this. To represent symbolically the number one is extremely difficult. And let me see if I can represent the difficulty. Suppose I put down this mark and say that's what I mean by one. Now, we're going to take this as its field. Isn't that likely that to really ensure that I mean by one, that doesn't happen? Because now, or this doesn't happen. So therefore, would you agree, I mean by one? No, gosh, this has to go on unendingly. But by the same logic, would you not agree? We wouldn't want someone to do this or this, and therefore to represent this adequately, we need this again. Now, I wonder whether that's enough, because actually someone might do this, might they not? And therefore, to represent the idea of one symbolically, to understand what we mean, would you not agree it entails that we have this? And by the same logic, And by the same logic, now look here, if I have this, what happens when I do this? Well, then I have half. Well then, therefore, would you not agree, this has to go on infinitely? All of these have to go on infinitely? And equally well, what would happen if, by the same prog process, I were to do this? And therefore, would you not agree, I have to continue my work? And, and, Therefore, if I really want to write the number one, would you not agree I need an infinite space to adequately represent what I mean by one? Now, then there isn't room to add one and one is two. You need another plane, you need another plane, and then you're adding in a different way. You need to create different spaces to do these mathematical processes. But what does this mean? if we define one this way. Well, let's go one more step. We do not agree that any number we take from what we've just talked about, it really isn't this way. It's really every number, if it is a number, this number placed here denominator, tells us how many parts there are. How many parts? There are four parts. There are three, four parts. There are two, three parts. There's one, two parts of two parts. So one of two, two of three. But we only mean one of them, don't we? I don't mean two of these sets. Therefore, to really, we need this, don't we? To make sure we know what we're talking about and not something else. So therefore, every number, whenever it is understood properly, is really that. The one must always be understood because you're only saying there is one five, one six. Therefore, behind the entire arithmetic system, 
there is a one which must be expressed or understood in this way at the base of all numbers therefore it then brings these together all right it's saying one together as a unity that includes all its parts as a whole that's what this does now oh. this means therefore that this series this series is unlimited yet each is a limit <clears throat> each is a limit this each is a limit each defines it limits it to that and nothing else therefore number is nothing other than an expression of the power of the limit and the unlimited right? because this is a continuous and each one of them is a limit therefore beneath the idea of one and the many numbers is the idea of limit and unlimited or continuous if that's the case, then the necessary idea that follows if one is not one in many, but limit and unlimited. Now we have just shown, have we not, that from this consideration, once there is this thing called limit and unlimited, from it we can derive all numbers or one and many. So that therefore we can say the one, the good, the necessary intellectual, as it were, metaphysical creation, if you prefer to talk of it in this way, or the necessary idea that follow once you posit the one and the good is limit and unlimited and from that you can derive one and many now what other ideas can we then generate from that well let's take a look you see once we have one and many <clears throat> from what we've just seen for each of these each of these things called number because one in many is an expression therefore of number for each of these <clears throat> there is necessarily would you not agree to understand them to understand them right whatever symbol there is to Arabic number two there must be something therefore about it which is the same two marks something about the three as its members that must be the same and yet each one of those two and three is other or different therefore from the idea of one and many we can say you have same and other Now look, let's try it again. In order to have same, that means there must be something and something else which you are saying between them. There is this curious property called sameness. Therefore, it already presupposes a two-ness. Therefore, since it presupposes a tunis, in order to have same, it presupposes number, tunis. Therefore, it's only after you can talk about one and many that you can talk about same and other because you can derive same and other from 
working with the idea of one and many. Now, these are the three basic ideas, sets of ideas, that are called many things in one way or the other. Of course, they're basic ways of expressing things. Sometimes they're called forms. Sometimes they're called ideas, primary ideas. <clears throat> but you see, if there is, if you can say there exists then these kinds of primary ideas, then these ideas must have existed prior to any creation. Well, remember we talked a moment ago about creation. Let's talk about the demiorgos, the God that generates the universe, or God the creator. In order to create it, God looks upon it and calls it good in Christian world, Hebraic world. Right. He looks upon it and calls it good. He does it six times in a row. Therefore, there must be an idea in the mind of God of what is good. Right. He looked upon it and called it good. Therefore, prior to creation, there must be this idea of good. In the Platonic world, that's equally true, but they go a step further. Right? <clears throat> And the whole universe, therefore, a manyness, is produced on just one basic idea, and that is God looked upon himself and created the universe to be as much as possible like himself. Well, God is one. He created his universe as a oneness. And then this idea in the mind of God must be the model, and this must be the copy, and the relationship between a model and a copy is likeness. Therefore, in the process of creation, the most fundamental idea is likeness, without which the universe could not come into existence. Therefore, likeness is a primary idea, which is sometimes called the supreme originating idea of the cosmos. Therefore, unless the idea, the, the idea, the capacity to grasp the idea of likeness is clear in, in the mind or in, in the nature of, uh, of reality, there could not be the reality itself or what then develops. Now, Therefore, we have another set of ideas, and these are sometimes called the uh, productive ideas, productive ideas. Let's do it this way. All right. Next, in order to talk about model and copy as we have, from which we got the idea of likeness, three other ideas naturally follow. Three ideas naturally follow. Model, copy. One idea, what is it? Well, <laughs> one must be greater than the other. Therefore, if there is the capacity to create in the mind of God, there must have been an idea in the mind of God upon which he modeled the universe. And therefore, since he had that model and he's creating the copy, this must be greater than that. Therefore, the idea of greatness must be the prior idea the condition for greatness must exist or you can never have model and copy. Now, in the same way, right, God looked upon it and saw it as good. All right, that means a judgment. Hey, that is good. In the Greek world, God can only create or do an activity that is beautiful. Because that means, therefore, if it's beautiful, all right, let's see whether we can get some of the ideas here. If God creates something and every act is, is beautiful, then necessarily the whole act must have symmetry, order, 
patterns, balance, for these are the formal properties of beauty. Therefore, in creating and, and moving the universe from a one to a many, from the nature of the one to the manyness to, to the demiurgos to the universe, necessarily if it is to be an ordered thing, there must be the possibility of order and the idea of order must presuppose symmetry, patterns, balance, and that's grasped together in one word called beauty. Now, for these ideas to function in any kind of way, and let's talk about in what way. For the demiurgos, therefore, to create the universe, there must already be the conditions for bringing it into existence. Right? The conditions must be prior to the creation. Therefore, before there is creation, there must be the possibility of likeness, greatness, and beauty. There must already exist the possibility of limit, unlimited, one, many, same, and other. Notice we can jump back and talk about it uh, there must be something the same between the model and the copy, or there wouldn't be a model and copy relationship. But in anything that has a model and copy, it also presupposes otherness. Right? Model and copy, this presupposes a one and a many. Limited, unlimited. The, the model is the limit. That is what it is possible to unfold. The unfolding is the unlimited. Now, for these ideas to function, right, to function, or well, the possibility of them uh, coming together presupposes, therefore, that each one of these must, uh, <coughs> um, must, must function in the way in which they most properly are. Mm, Say, so what does that mean? Each of the ideas, being what they are, has preconditions for the universe. Each must have that capacity must represent that capacity in the universe, and therefore there must be something in there that allows each of these ideas to function ideally in the way in which they are. That's the idea of justice. Therefore, in the very nature of reality, right, what I'm talking about now as reality is the condition prior to creation. There must be these ideas or creation could never come into being. Right. For creation to come into being, therefore, these ideas must pre-exist as the condition for creation, and each must function in their proper way. But for each to function in their proper way is to pro properly function, properly function, function justly. Therefore, there must be something in the very core of the nature of reality, justice. Justice is the most significant concept because behind it are all ideals. Because to have an ideal presupposes that the ideal is functioning in the most proper way possible, and that's another way of expressing the idea of justice. Now, I would like now to shift, all right, and see whether we can bring this a little bit together and say from one the one, the good, for it in some way to be responsible for the cause of a uh, universe, a coming into existence of an ordered universe, there must be a model, this must be the copy, For the one to generate in any way a manyness, right? therefore the very idea of one and many must, must pre-exist. We saw that the idea of one and many presupposes limit and unlimited. Right? We saw how the idea of limit and unlimited one and many uh, can uh, from those necessarily you can derive the idea of same and other, sometimes called difference, by the way. And those are the basic ideas. Now, 
for anything to then generate, right, for anything to generate, for anything to generate at all, you need another set of ideas. All right, what are they? Likeness, greatness, uh, ah, most importantly, right, oh, I'll save justice for last, beauty, and justice. These then are the ideas that must pre-exist the condition for creation as these are the very necessary conditions for anything emerging. So these are the fundamental ideas for generation as these are the preconditions for anything in any, in any way emerging from a primary unity or oneness. Now, the idea of greatness we should talk about. Right? Greatness in this sense means wherever there is something that can exhibit its highest qualities, anything that is, can exhibit most ideally right? um, a magnificence, anything therefore that can show itself most fully what it is, that's the idea of greatness. Therefore, the idea of greatness necessarily involves the idea of excellence. From the idea of greatness comes excellence. From the idea of excellence necessarily comes the idea of virtue. Because, and we can see this quite easily in Greek thought, the English word excellence comes from, a, from a, it's an, it's, it doesn't come from, but it's a way of deriving or translating the Greek word areteia, excellence. Another way of translating it is virtue, but no one uses the word virtue or very few people in today's world. When we talk about we can talk about the virtue of a horse without thinking that the horse may lie or may not lie, right? What we really mean when we talk about virtue in the 18th, 18th century is the highest quality of a horse. Therefore, it's excellence. We can ask, therefore, is there an excellence for a man? Is there something he must do so that whatever is potentially within him emerges as its highest expression? What is the highest expression of man? What is the highest expression for man? If there is a highest expression for man, then that must be the condition for that be, for that to be, must mean that there is an excellence that man can possess and can in some condition, in some way manifest. And that means it presupposes that the possibility for excellence must be built in the very fabric of the nature of the universe itself within the very conditions for the universe itself. Therefore, if man, therefore, can find within himself some way to find his highest expression, that would be an excellence. That excellence, therefore, is a greatness, because great, from greatness you derive excellence. Therefore, we must ask, what is it about man that can exhibit that most interesting of all possible things? Excellence. Because would you not agree, people do nothing but spend huge amounts in our culture in order to see excellence. When people go to a sport event and they see their heroes function on the highest level in basketball doing remarkable things, they love to see that excellence, don't they? They pay money to see it. They sit in the first row and spend enormous amounts of money in order to be present before excellence. When people go to concerts, when people go to before films, what is it they want to see? They want to see and be present, right? They want to be present before excellence. Would you not agree? What's the reason people go to a sporting event when they could watch the same thing on a TV. They want to be present before excellence. That's the draw. That's what you want to see. You want to see it happening in front of you. 
because when you see it happening in front of you, you participate in some way in the display of excellence, and that excites us, and we find that the most rewarding experience we can find. Now, what is the highest, therefore, sport of man? So, there are many kinds of excellence in music and sports and theater, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In this game, in this game, in this game, in Plato, justice is the most significant ideal for man. That means every part of man must be working properly, and that means the parts of the soul must be functioning in such a way that each is functioning in the most ideal way. And if each part is functioning in the most ideal way, then one's reason is functioning in the highest way. One spirited element then can be joined together in its uh, pursuit, and the desiring part op uh, creates no opposition, and therefore the three parts of the soul then can work together in a unified way. When it operates in a unified way in Plato's Republic, he says then what happens here is that man becomes, man becomes a one out of many. Because there are times when we are in conflict between what reason proposes and the spirited part of our nature may not agree with it, and our desiring part may be in conflict, and therefore we're scattered and our energies and our goals uh, reflect that kind of internal conflict. But when our desires and our spirit and our reason all together towards some significant goal are brought together into a unity, Plato says that is man is becoming a one out of a many. And the practice that maintains that, whatever it is that maintains that over a period of time, he says, you know what that is? The practice that maintains this condition, that's the name of wisdom. That is wisdom. What is it? To know how to maintain that over a period of time towards the highest goals, that's wisdom. Now, that desire, look here, that striving for the highest greatness, all right? If there is a greatness to man, an excellence to man, and what would show it most clearly? Because when you are operating in that way, where all the parts are functioning together as a, as a unity, in harmony, and all in accord, all right? then one is striving and one is exhibiting an excellence or in a greatness, but towards what goal? For what goal? Well, at uh, a great section in the Republic, uh, 540A, Book 7, he said, man, man, see, Man, well, when we first moved to the symposium, man can experience beauty, a magnificent expression that man then encounters in the highest struggles for beauty itself. He can experience the perfection of beauty. In that, he can then reach a greatness, not the highest greatness, but he can reach a greatness. To do that, he has to bring himself together and has to be proper and, and fair with all things. That must be there. But there's something higher than that, isn't it, from what we've done. Because all of these are the conditions for the one uh, generating a manyness, or the condition for a manyness, and overflowing. Well, when these things, you see, let's put one more name on this, and then we can push together to the conclusion. When these things, and likeness, right, when these things together can be best, when these ideas can be best assigned to something, what is that something? What other word can we use for it? For Plato, uh, in the symposium, the Rouse translation calls that 
reality. Touching reality, as he calls it. Reaching out and touching reality. That reality, that reality, which includes all of these ideas necessarily, right, must be inferred as a presence, is then experienced as what we talked about many times before, a luminous, divine radiance, right? having the most interesting of all properties, no beginning and end, right? Uh, not here and there. It permeates all reality. It's beyond all space and time considerations. It's the primary source of all beauty found in the physical universe. This then is to behold reality, watch the language now, to behold reality is to experience it as beauty. To behold reality in Plato takes on a peculiar interesting name and that is the idea of the good. Capital I. It's not the good, it's beholding the good. To behold the good, to behold the good, that's an experience, to behold the good is called the idea of the good. What is that like? <whistles> Luminous divine radiance. Therefore, in Plato, he said the way to approach the very nature of the highest term, this light with it, which is within us, right? within the soul, right? within the soul, this light, like a seed, like a seed, right? planted in our souls, when we incline towards that light, that's the language he uses, when we incline towards it, drawn to it, incline towards it. When we're drawn to it, incline towards it, that very draw, that very energy, that very power that, we, that draws us to it, that very power draws us to it, that is the power, that is the energy, right? that is striving towards reaching this experience, which is the luminous divine radiance. He said, that's the way in which you actually experience it. Right? It's already there. It's already there. It's not something you have to find. It's already there. It's in our souls. And therefore, when we're drawn or inclined to it, that opens the possibility of the experience of the nature of the good, which is another way, of course, we would put the one. Now, one of the necessary ideas that follow from the presence of the one, follows from the presence of the one, somewhere in here is an eraser, yeah, here we are. Say, one, Oneness, unity, unitary, right? All of these ideas are a step further in a progression, like a declension, therefore like a paradigm, a declension. Therefore, as a, as a consequence of the very nature of the one, unity, that everything in the universe therefore is preserved by unity, which is a, which is a shadow of the one. Now the other side of one, oneness, unity, good, remember these are really hyphenated terms, oneness is goodness. Oneness is goodness. Therefore the very, the very overflowing of the good that produces the manyness 
necessarily, there is necessarily a, a, a outpouring of goodness because just as the one generates oneness or unity, so the good naturally overflows in goodness since these are hyphenated, it comes from it. And another name for goodness, which naturally flows through the universe, is providence. Right? And the idea of providence is, as we mentioned last time, is to see video, to see, prov to see before the intellect. Right? It's prior to the intellect. It's an overflowing goodness. Right? It's an overflowing goodness. And in that overflowing goodness, the universe then can be created, and that's the primary goodness that runs through the universe. And that sense of goodness then can be experienced most directly in this overwhelming light experience, because in it, one then recognizes and beholds, another word for reality is that there is a primary goodness throughout the universe, which one encounters directly when the mind is unified, when the mind is unified, right? when the three parts of the soul therefore are striving towards this experience, and in that experience, one's philosophy is vindicated into a total unity. Um, there. Thank you, had a good time doing it. Now, stop and ask questions. I think we need maybe three blackboards so I can just move throughout them. Yes? I know this is, this is Plato's, uh, Plato's model. Yes, yes. All of this comes out of uh, Plato, Plotinus, Proclus. And I'm glad you mentioned that. I brought a copy of uh, Proclus with me. He is one of the greatest figures in uh, history. And he is very seldom studied in colleges. Very seldom. Proclus. Uh, he's the only he's the only systematic philosopher. You see, let me see if I can just portray something for you. Here you have Plato, Plotinus, and Proclus. Uh, now, Plato does all of those magnificent dialogues. Plotinus looks back on Plato and is interested in how to use this Platonic system as a spiritual system. And therefore you can say that uh, the whole, he, he has a very beautiful section where he talks about uh, uh, it has happened often, his soul has uh, traveled and, had, and the soul descends back into the body. He's a mystic, he's a philosophical mystic. Right? Therefore he designed a spiritual system which emerges out of and it's a blend of and it includes the philosophy of Plato. Now, here we're talking about 400 BC. Here we're talking about 270 AD. And here we're talking about approximately 470, give or take a few years, AD. So we have approximately, uh, give or take, 900 years in this tradition. Between, especially between uh, 270 and uh, 470. In this period of time, there are many very interesting philosophers. 
and we don't have their writings anymore. There were many interesting philosophers between Plato and Plotinus. Poseidonus is one of them. And we don't have any of their writings anymore. They've all been destroyed one way or the other. But with Proclus, what we have is we have him reviewing all of the major thinkers that he knows. And therefore, he brings them together into a beautiful chain, a golden chain, as it were. So therefore, Proclus combines the Platonic tradition into a unity, and he caps it, as it were, by showing how you can understand each of these people in a more complete way by going back to Plato and what he finds in Plato. And um, he brings, therefore, the whole Hellenic tradition into a magnificent system. One of the chief uh, primary thinkers in Christian metaphysics, the primary architect of all Christian metaphysics, is Dionysius. And Dionysius's writings became the very foundation of all metaphysics. St. Thomas Aquinas, by the way, quotes Dionys Dionysius 1,700 times. Albert Magnus quotes him many, 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 hundred, uh, many times. And this thinker, Dionysius, who is now called pseudo-Dionysius, pseudo meaning false or fake, was shown to be someone who must have studied with Proclus and disguised his writings in such a way that they could be accepted by the Christian tradition, which at that time was putting a formal end to all of the Platonic schools of philosophy, closed them down. Philosophers were exiled. They, all, they went into Syria. And therefore, it appears that a student who totally familiar with Proclus was able to grasp this tradition, reduce it, in a very beautiful way, compressed it, and that became the architect, the very foundation and the cornerstone of Christian metaphysics. When this was disclosed, by the way, and shown to be the case, it caused quite a bit of an uproar. And uh, there are some thinkers uh, who would still like to consider him as a great Christian, even though it was based upon a, that's the whole thing was a forgery. But in any case, uh, that Platonic tradition then continued in Europe in a disguised, abbreviated form through which we can then find in uh, such thinkers as St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, Proclus did one, one more thing which is really startling. He made several commentaries of Plato dialogues, and he takes practically each sentence by itself or just a couple at a time and he shows how much philosophical richness is behind each one of his statements. And so when you read Proclus, you have to go back into Plato and stand in awe because if Proclus is correct about how to understand Plato, Plato must have been such a startling, profound thinker that there's been no one like him in the history of the world. And the difficulty with Plato, if I can add something, is that uh, there, there is always a curiosity, and this is the curiosity. Uh, Jesus had Paul. Jesus had Mark. Socrates had Plato. If they could ever switch if there could have been a Plato for Jesus and a Paul for Socrates, they had a totally different kind of ball game. But the immense artistry and sophistication and insight into Socrates that Plato had brought the dialogues into an art form that are truly astonishing and have astonished all people who get into them and master them. Proclus was the great master of them, opened them up, 
in that splendid way in which he did, which brings us to wonder at the possible profundity. And some people think, in fact, he's demonstrated that. And if that's the case, then there is something going on in Plato's Socrates' era that is so enormous philosophically and of significance that it's difficult to gauge it or describe it with accuracy. Now here's a uh, Proclus's commentary on Plato's Parmenides. And I might as well, I'll, I'll read the, um, oh, get a nice part. Um, Oh, let's get a part about the way he talks about how to reach the one. What else is the one in ourselves except the operation and energy of this striving for the one? The energy and power striving for the one, that's the one. What else is the one in ourselves except the operation and energy of the striving? It is therefore this interior understanding of unity, which is a projection, as it were, an expression of the one, which is in ourselves, in ourselves. That we call the one. So the one itself is not nameable, but the one in ourselves, by, this, by, by, by means of this, as to what is most appropriate to it, we must speak of it and make it known to our peers. I'd like to read that again because I don't like the way I accented a sentence. What else is the one in ourselves except the operation and energy of the striving? It is therefore this interior understanding of unity, which is a projection and as it were an expression of the one in ourselves that we call the one. So the one itself is not nameable, but the one in ourselves. By means of this, as what is most appropriate to it, we first speak of it and make it known to our peers. There are two activities in us, one appetitive, the other reflective. That abiding activity that is common to all may not be absent from our souls, but these must be responsible to the energies that concern the first principle, so the love of the one must be inextinguishable. This is indeed why this love is real, even though the one is incomprehensible and unknowable. But consciousness labors and falls short when it encounters the unknown. So, silent understanding is before that which is put into language, and desire is before any understanding, before that which is inexpressible, as well as before that which is analyzable. Why then do we call the understanding of unity within ourselves one and not something else? Because I should say unity is the most venerable of all things we know. For everything is preserved and perfected by being unified. Unity then is the most venerable thing which perfects and preserves everything. And that is why we give this name to the concept that we have of the first principle. Ah, let me get another one. Oh, the quote I had before is from, from uh, Proclus. So Socrates says this at the beginning that it is knowable, the good. But immediately adds a qualification saying how it is knowable, namely to him to whom inclines his own light towards it. What does he mean by light? Right. Except the one in the soul. For he said the good can be compared with the sun and that this light is like a seed from the good planted in our souls. In any of Plato's dialogues, does he ever, does he ever explore the possibility you know, be, it seems here that, that quite, a, you know, quite a bit flows from the, from the creative act 
the act of cre if, if creation mm -hmm. happen, mm -hmm. then uh, greatness must have the idea of greatness must have already been present. The idea of beauty, justice, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, the condition for things are always prior to the action, right? The conditions for a fire must be present before a fire. The conditions for growth must be prior to growth. The conditions for creation must be prior to creation. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the, the things in my reading of, uh, my reading of the dialogues, uh, Socrates' method had sense to be that uh, it would seem that if, if Socrates were here today, he would, he, well, I mean, I know I, mm -hmm. I do, and I, but um, he would want to know that, well, if we consider, if we consider that uh, the creative act, uh, if the creative act occurred, then all of this, then all of this must be present Mm -hmm. Prior to that creative mm -hmm. act, then uh, in the in the I guess the reaching out for mm -hmm. for truth, mm -hmm. then what if the what if the creative act never occurred? Then if the creative act act never occurred, then what is the nature of reality? Then it seems like that, that's that's uh, a necessary mm -hmm. question. Yeah. I, if I gather your point, say, so if, even if this is all an illusion, there must be still some prior conditions for the illusion. Yeah, if, if, if there's some prior condition, then what are those, and what is that condition? Well, there would have to be a trickster. There has to be either a trickster or the possibility of something tricking us, and we must be susceptible to the illusion. Therefore, in the nature of man, he may experience the illusion and call it real. In that sense, man, man may have higher ideas within himself than we're in this illusionary world. Right? Therefore, man would, man would be gaining a prominence in nature beyond that which nature produced if nature is an illusion. Now you might say, but that, the, what he then would consider would be illusory. Oh yes, but it would be representing the conditions for it, and that must be real. Well, no, that's, that's one yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. I, but then it brings me back to the question that I had last night, which is, uh, uh, if we, it seems as though the system, the system ex explains the, the system explains reality uh, given that, that man is, uh, is present in it. And then it goes back yes. to explain what we see. Yes. And then it's, then, then right. it explains what we see, yeah. it explains only the appearances. That's right. And then That's if, right. if we have, if we are looking for yeah. the truth, it seems as though we cannot accept the truth that only explains appearances. That's right. That's right. That's right. All of this reflection follows from a certain set of reasonings that start with the appearance. That's right. Well, what the appearance is not, a, a, the appearance is, uh, is, yeah. You see, what is the reality behind the appearance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can show you something curious. Um, our culture, of which we're all part, we start our reflections with the appearances. And we try then to try to find out the condition for it, the rules that operate, principles or rules, to account for this 
appearance. And from that, then, we want to then reach a total picture, which we then can use with this total picture. We can then use this total picture to understand man's place in it. That's the way our culture works. In the Platonic tradition, that's not the case. In the Platonic tradition, uh, it's this way. Uh, from man's highest and most profound experience, That's where they take off from, see. Given man's highest and most profound experience and insight, what does that say about the, about the conditions for that? The principles and rules that must operate if that's true. See? Oh, then they get a total picture, and this then begins to be, right? If the total picture must then come back and be verified and make sense of man's highest experience. But, but see, it starts with man. I know, so that system, this is that different. system has man at the center. Yeah. So mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. then, um, that's right. And I as well, if the, if the, if the system mm -hmm. is only, if it's only true in relationship to man, if I am, if I am wanting to find, if I am searching for a reality that uh, is prior, prior to man, then it doesn't appear that I can find reality uh, by means of this system. Oh, that's, that's quite true, except for one thing. Suppose the highest experience discloses the nature of mind. And suppose the nature of the most profound experience and insight not only gives an insight into mind, but suppose in that insight you see there's no difference between mind and reality. Then what? Then what? Well, I guess what I... What I still would want to start at some point, I would, I would, you know, when we started with, we started with the one, mm -hmm. then we went from the one to mm -hmm. the one to the many, mm -hmm. and the many was predicated on the existence of a creation, but we haven't, we, uh, at least in as I followed the, followed the, uh, the presentation, the, we didn't, ex we didn't establish that the creation actually occurred, we only assumed that it occurred is because man, we assumed that man here is, is here, so, we, so the uh, creation must have occurred, but if the, if, man, if the creation didn't occur, and man didn't occur, then what is the nature of reality? That's and right. We, it seems That's as right. though That's we're right. still That's right. on the outside of that. That's right. That's right. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's that great uh, statement attributed to St. Augustine when someone asked him what was God doing before creation. He said, creating a hell for people like you who asked that question. <laughs> but, you see, um, uh, we can, t see, in this system, in this system, the basic assumption, uh, basic assumption is right here. That man, that man, generic man, man, and there are some men, there are some who are willing to explore these kinds of states of mind so they then can make this identity. That's either there or it isn't, sir. Is that consistent with what we were going on last night? Uh, Pardon? Last night we were talking about the soul. You have the moral part of the soul and then a sort of picture yeah. of Mm-hmm. You've got these qualities of, I guess, immortality or something, uh, which are, which are 
forms, then you've got these uh, one in many, which are like your matrix for emergence. That's right. So that's right. So really, yeah. what you've done is you've generalized to last night's lecture, right? Yeah. So you were talking soul. Uh, how does that? Uh, that's that's a soul. How do I get that back to mind? Uh, well, the ordering process. Yeah. The that aspect of the soul, which we call the eternal, which we call the being, which we call the seer, that capacity of the mind to turn upon itself and know itself. That's the eternal part of the mind. Right? And uh, this is the essential assumption of all this, that the mind has the capacity to turn upon itself and discover its own reality. And that, that, is either, that either can be verified or it can't. That, that's the internal soul, right? Pardon? It's, 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 when it turns that, upon itself, yes. well, there's this experience that goes on. But then we were talking last night, there was the realization that the soul has a mortal part in it. That's right. And a mortal part. That's right. Which makes me wonder, um, this assumption we're making that you have to have conditions uh, before you can have a creation. We're, we're dealing with a part of the soul which is not perceptible which is immortal, which is beyond conditions. So I would think it would also be open to like unconditional creation. But I, I don't know. So yeah, I, I've never yeah. been there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure I know what you mean when you say an unconditional creation. Well, we're, we're claiming that we have to have uh, conditions for creation. That's right. And that's because I'm dealing in a perceptible world, cause and effect. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what goes on in a world that's not perceptible. I don't know if it still has the quality of having conditions before creation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, the only way I would know that is if you could talk to somebody who's been there and could mm -hmm. uh, scope the scene or something. Mm -hmm. Right now we're thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. is, is our logic stepped down from that or I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, um, You see, the, the other way of looking for a reality independent of man, while man is looking for a reality independent of man, has all kinds of inherent problems. But whatever the, whether they're resolved or not, it's clear in this system that this is, this is you see, uh, I think this is the real puzzle that brings to birth philosophy. Because it's only when someone has encountered high, very extremely high and profound states of mind that you wonder about the nature of what's going on with you. You're driven to seek an explanation. In the same way, when one apprehends that beauty <clears throat> in the way in which we described it, then one falls in love with that beauty. One wants to experience it again and again, and the highest desire is to step into it and be bathed in it once more. It's out of that experience and that drive and that need gives birth to philosophy. Now, in the modern world, we, modern world, uh, or this kind of modern thinking, doesn't want to start here. We want to start independent of man. Like there are all kinds of lectures into subatomic physics and. Your talk here, you didn't mention man at all. You mentioned mind. Uh, I didn't mention mind tonight. Uh, man. Not that I saw. You talked about God. Well, wow. the whole generated universe had certain qualities. No, did I say that? Um, From man's highest, most profound experience. Yeah. And also well, the final. I hope I. I uh, we talked about. How does he see the encounter with the one man? Well, no, I think in the beginning of this, you pretty much generated a system. That's right. And you, know, you basically had a model. And That's had right. And I wanted... The qualities of the model and the qualities of the matrix, and then you pretty much allowed us to enter into it via this... But here's this was the passageway. It ended with man, the soul. Right? This light like a seed planted in our souls. This. Okay. Was here, right? right, right. That's, that's the part I thought it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I would like next time. Hold it. I'm sorry. Okay, Please. So you set up the model up here, okay? Now here's the doorway in, right? Yes. But somehow or another, we've assumed.
assume that in this area up here, there's lightness, greatness, mm -hmm. and all these qualities. We've inferred those qualities. Yes. And yes. to prove them out, you have to have the experience, right? How, how do we, how do, let's say, well, we, took, we, we generate a model, and from that model, we went through a rational process of saying why those conditions have to exist, and then mm -hmm. they have to be just yeah. and balanced. Yeah, yeah. So those, well, those qualities in ourself yeah. allow us to get to the doorway, partly. Is that right? Yeah. Well, you're quite right, because this is micro and macro cosm argument, you know. Like what takes place in the universe takes place within ourselves on a lesser scale. And therefore, there's a, a, a analogy, as the universe is to uh, mind itself, so man is to his particular mind. And that's why um, we're going to have to deal with that question, which we didn't deal with up to this point, about how you can talk about soul and many souls, and it's still on my mind, and I'd like to sneak it in one night, maybe next week. I'll do it next, part, next time. These conditions of this world here, Mm -hmm. If those conditions were X, 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 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I was not X1, not X2, not X3, not X4, not X5, it's sort of like a, a, trying to fit the round peg in the square hole, right? Well, it is like a uh, Penrose tiles. Penrose tiles. Uh, that's a mathematician, physicist, who's, who has designed tiles that fit together in a remarkable way. And oh, you fit your tiles together in a remarkable way? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, this is like taking ideas and fitting them together, like Penrose might or some designer might, putting tiles together in such a way that they fit together, or a mosaic, or a tapestry, or a symphony. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Am I missing something here? No, no. Uh, we might be surprised that we agree. Well, you're talking about this Penrose guy. I'm getting the impression that you think it's a pretty funny way to do it. Is that right? No, I, I'm I'm one of his admirers. I, oh, okay. I enjoy Penrose very much, oh, okay. and, and uh, I think that the mathematics, the, the necessary mathematics to understand tiling, is an appreciation for shapes, which is where mathematics is now going with uh, chaos theories, okay. systems theory, and okay. oh no, no. Okay? For at least that means okay, it just means until next time. Until next time. Now I want to take the same subject and we're going to just read it and how Plato understands the same problem, the one. That's all we're going to do. And it's only in a few pages, so I would like you to know the pages we're going to deal with. It's in Plato's Republic. And let me get you those pages. And uh, so if you're, if you're looking at your soul and you see this little tiny light, you, 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 you head to the light, right? Yep. <laughs> okay, here we are. We want to deal with the problem of arithmetic in Plato's Republic, Book 7. And... Uh, I would say 523 those are not No, no, those are the numbers along the side called Stephanus numbers. Um, to uh, 520, end of 526 or 527. Okay, Stephanus numbers. Essentially, the study of arithmetic in Plato's Republic. That is the study of the one, 
and I would very much like to deal with it. I think there's a way of understanding it, and I'd like to present it for next time. Okay? Okay, thank you.